can go further. So what is the Sufi, what is the mystic? Well, to my mind, a mystic is one who opts for God as the top priority of intellectual curiosity and maintains that priority by remembrance continuously as ordered and suggested by God and also fights within and without and tries to acquire a balance within himself and without. Okay, okay. So, and uh, especially in this country we uh, see like uh, many manifestations of uh, Sufism who maybe are not uh, directly related. So, what, uh, what is not a Sufi, we can say? Well, these days you hardly see a Sufi because Sufi is not understood by percentages. It's not that it is is one in hundred or one in thousand or it could be one in millions, one in billions. Because uh, the basic sincerity to search for God and then to pursue it all their life is basically the main obsession with the person who is intelligent, who is inquiry insist on finding truth and maybe in the beginning and you search for knowledge and you search for the knowledge within yourself but to my mind the natural end of all curiosity and knowledgeability and search and hunt for truth ends up with God and we have seen many other people who, are, who fall short of this expectation on the high end of their moral exhibition and they fall short they look for possessions, powers, they look for strength in their own self rather than, you see, getting rid of their self. For us, the law of God is very clear that anybody who wants to find me should find an opposition in his own self. So anybody who looks like promoting a sense of power in him or a position in him does not qualify for a suvi. Over the years, I mean, say, when everything is corrupted, Sufism is corrupted most. For example, we have to find out whether there can be a Sufi in other religions or not, and we say no, because all other religions are a regular procedural progression on knowledge of God. And starting from Adam to Muhammad, وسلم, we are proceeding towards getting more and more knowledge about God. So if the Jew says, I have found God, we will not believe, because it is just a, a nursery of believers. And then we come to Christ and we, we know for sure they were more progressive than the Jews, but then they also fall short. The man has always been maturing in his knowledge, and so the message has also been maturing with the same speed. And with, with the ages, with prophecy, they have been progressing. Finally, it ended up, the revolutions ended up with Quran. And if anybody who doesn't believe in the Quran and the Prophet of God and the Prophet who brought Quran would not be qualifying for a fuller knowledge of higher idealism or metaphysical entities or God himself. So we said okay, it's very difficult to find God without Islam. It's not possible. So, uh, do you think uh, it uh, remains uh, some Sufi uh, in Pakistan or it's finished? Uh, well, you know, Sufis are mostly, they, are, they don't claim things, they, they don't bother. The worst thing in the social life is to look for projections and Sufis anti-projection. All the qualities which are known for a successful man are reverse qualities for a Sufi. So you will not find him in public and exhibiting himself. He's not an exhibitionist, he's a not, not a narcissist. He doesn't have those sort of things which qualify him as a successful worldly man. So it's obvious that you will not find Sufi running on the roads are claiming things for himself, are, you see, exhibiting his exercise or modeling himself into yogas or lamas, you see. This is not Sufism. This is only concentrational arts. Yes. No sound, please. Okay, we can continue. So, you were telling me that uh, 
there is a constant uh, remembering of God within a Sufi. So what kind of particular relationship or attitude has a Sufi with God? That's with all the greatness Allah has, I mean, say, you are honored with one thing, that you can reach Him. The thing is, God has created this world for Himself. It's not that we created this earth. It's not that we created all this jam pack of this world. So naturally, He means some business with us. And He has explained it in so many verses. Inna halaynaw sabila imma shakrim wa imma kafura. I give you a talent, I give you thinking, I give you wisdom, I give you apparatus of mind to think. And all I wanted was to you should go on earth, think about life, think about you see surroundings, think about the universe, think about your life patterns, and try to find out that who's the maker, who's the creator. And you should develop greater love for him rather than anything. Because it will be absurd to look for things below God's status as God's. So we are bound to consider God as the top truth, reality. And not only that, that the one who interferes in every bit of our life, in our first breath, in our last breath, he gives us honor, he gives us dishonor. He gives us children, he gives us parents. And when everybody, everything is given by God, you know, who is such a wise man who will be considering less, uh, God as lesser importance? And you know what? So our fault is very simple. It, this fault lies with all human beings. We give lesser importance to the top priority and more importance to the lesser priorities. Okay. So in this uh, in this way of. Uh, I mean, is this, uh, is this uh, mainly, I mean, uh, this attitude will be, will be some uh, love attitude, fear attitude, respect attitude with God? It's basically love. Because uh, basically the attitude has been made very clear in the Quran. Okay, do remember me like you remember your parents, your father, your kith and kin, your sweethearts and whatever it is. But do it, uh, remember me a little more and he needs a preference over all his created things. But the first principle lies in mind, not in heart, you see. You have to analyze things. You have to see who's more important for you in the entire life. For a short period you can have your priorities different. For a student goes to college, university and you say education is the top priority. Then you come and you say now marriage is the top priority. Then you say job is the main priority. Then after retirement you say now the rest and the pension is perhaps the top priority. But the fact is very different. There is a priority of a whole life also. It's not partial priority, it's the total priority. When we consider the whole life of a human being and we say, he came here for God and he should know God and he leave this earth with a knowledge of God and with a faith in God. This is what Sufi does right from the very beginning. He sorts out the priorities of life. He arranges. He knows what is more important, what is less important. And he passes through this earth like a, you know, traveler. Maybe things are very beautiful in the way. We are not supposed to reject things. We are not supposed to uh, refuse. We are supposed to create a balance in our desire, where is the strongest desire is for the truth, for God and for reality, and the lesser desire. When we come back from after finding out the truth in our mind, then we go to the lesser. God doesn't refuse us any love for women, or love for children, or love for family, love for country. He doesn't refuse us any, any facility. He gave all these facilities. Life is a protocol made for human beings to arrange all those facilities, to make it possible. He made it possible for man to be comfortable on earth and to look for him, and to search for him, 
to refuse him, to deny him, to accept him, is the main project of the human life on earth. Say of the Sufi path, path. Say of the Sufi path, path. The end achievement. Well, must say, how can you limit the search, or how can you place a destiny? when uh, a finite being is moving into an infinite side, you see. So there is no destiny. It's a continuous movement of mind and heart into the uh, infinite. So uh, I don't think anybody can say there is a destiny or an end of going towards God. All I know is that you keep on living. A man who stops thinking creates a kind of a citadel for him, he kind of a kind of a barrier for him. But a man who thinks about God, who is constantly thinking about God, keeps on moving till his life, till the last breath. And he is in progress. And that's what we feel like. Everybody stops somewhere. People who do not have the God as the end in his mind, who does, do not think about the ultimate or the total reality, they stop somewhere in the way. Maybe somebody dies with his, the woman he likes and somebody dies with the office he has created and somebody dies with a lot of money he has created, he doesn't have the time to use it and dies of a heart attack, you see. But the man who lives with God lives till the last breath of his life. So there is no end, no particular end when you are moving with God. You keep on thinking, progressing, you keep on achieving some new phase of thought. Every day you are in a new thought, in a new mood, in a new creativity. So God is creating everything in all moments, you see. So you keep on also creating within your own self. And all mysticism is outgrowth. All mysticism is outgrowth. Remember this thing. We keep moving from one state of mind to the other state of mind, you see. Because this is the progress. In fact, it's intellectual progress, it's thinking progress. Maybe we are only intelligent like animals. And then we move on and we see we are intellectuals. And then move on and we concentrate and we see we, we have intuitions. But the last degree of the most refined intellect is ilham, which is mystics and men of God, you see. And ilham has no bounds. It's unlimited. Till you live, till your last breath, the fragrance of the knowledge of God, and also your own study of yourself, you see, it keeps on increasing. There is no end to the intellectual capacity of a mystic. So I always thought, wherever a mystic is, he is the top intellectual of his time. And remember one thing, mystics always remain in good humor. There are two kinds of honesty, you know. If an honest man is a pungent and bickering man, he doesn't belong to God. But anybody is honest with a good temper. Okay, so how, how could you, uh, if there is no end, uh, I mean perpetual progress, uh, how could you um, define the state of uh, Fana and uh, Baka? Uh, these terms have been very much misused by the lesser uh, uh, see, mystics. Perhaps they were not mystics at all. They, they talked like mystics, they looked like mystics, but they didn't have any sense. Fana doesn't mean the way that we, we get lost in, in God. No, there's nobody who gets lost in God. Fana means uh, to do away with our own physical uh, instinct qualities and to fill in the better ones that are given by God. Suppose I am a mean man, and I was a mean man. Suppose I am a grabber, and I have always been a grabber. Suppose I'm a liar, and I've been a liar, you see. So when I want, I know that I have these bad qualities. I have to do away with them. I have to finish them. I have to march on to learn truth. Instead of, you see, lying, I have to be generous instead of being mean. I have to depossess myself of those qualities. And when 
I, I do a changeover from this set of qualities to the other set of qualities. It means fana. And baka means to be stable with those qualities which have gained. It doesn't mean that you, you fall into the lap of God and He covers you up. It doesn't mean that. They, these, are very, these are terms which have been always been misreduced. They are misused. And they create a lot of confusion in the minds of people perhaps. But over the end, when you lose all your qualities, then God takes you over. I empty myself. I say, I empty myself with anger, with greed, with desire, with all sins. And I say, oh God, take me over. And then He fills me with His own qualities. And what are those qualities? His Rahman, His Rahim, His Karim, His Salam, His Momen. So a person looks like God. He's not a God, but he feels like God. People feel like that he's as kind as God could be. He's as nice as God could be. He's as truthful as God could be. So that's fana. It's, it's almost achievement, an achievement of qualities. First we try to follow our prophets, because the best of the qualities a human being could have from God as our prophet. And then we try to follow our prophet. This is called fana for Rasul. And even below that, they say, Fana Fashach. Fashach, suppose my students, uh, they like to, they would say, okay, we will like to be, end up like our teacher. But the teacher is not the end. So when they have acquired my quads, they would say, we will like to end up with the teacher of the teachers. That's Prophet, that's Fana for Rasul. And then when we know that our Prophet leads us to God and all those qualities which are found in the Prophet. They have been on the human level, on an earthly level. They have been transferred by God to human being. So we say, this is for now, for love. Okay, okay. So, finally, uh, a Sufi can know God or not? So. He certainly knows God. I'm saying nobody else knows God than him, better than him. Because if he is not sure, the quicker there are three steps. First, you have a mental argument for God. Every literate, every Sufi passes through this torture. He goes through skepticism. He goes through all what Marxism says, tells you. He goes through logical positivists. He goes through skeptics of East and West, agnostics. He goes through all forms of denials. That's what our kalma also is. La ilaha illallah. Try to establish what is not God before you say there is God. And when we finish our argument, when we complete, we know there is no doubt left in our mind. And this should, this search should be at the topmost level. Whether you are challenging or you are being challenged by the new Darwinian or the old Darwinian, whether you are being crossed by a logical positivist or, as you see, anthropologist. We see all these skeptic uh, points about God and we say they, they are not wrong people. They have raised the right kind of questions and we try to know the validity and truth of those questions and then we answer them back. We have more powerful arguments, you see. So when we get out of this ordeal of curiosity, we say there is no doubt in my mind there is God. And then we try to get closer to Him, that's mysticism. That's mysticism. Once we have found God, once we are very sure about God, when there is no doubt left about His existence in my heart, when I have analyzed every criticism against God, and I've got over it, I've solved this old sphinx. Then I go ahead and say, now Almighty Lord God, now that I've found you, I like to be with you. That's mysticism. Another start, another start. Yes. The, we can say the relationship between God and the world and with man. As I told you before, it's that we did not create this world. And we have not come out of an accidental combination of amino acids. It was meant to be so. You see, 
the sun would not have been at such a place if it had not been set by God. We we'll say about 10 million round this, it would have burnt us up. And 10 million years beyond, it would have frozen us. So moon, all these constellations, the placings, they are not accidental. They have been set to create a life belt, a life belt in this universe, in which a special experiment was done by Almighty Allah to create human beings. And then not only to create, He gave us something very extraordinary. I believe Allah has been, we are like robots, you see. We are all like robots. And He created so many numerous, you see, kinds of robots. Unlimited numbers, you see. We have 13, 1.3 million source of creation on earth. There could be 13 million ants in the skies also. Different sorts of creativity He has been doing. Then He thought, I need somebody special. I should give him a choice. Because he gave choice to nobody. Not to uh, people, not to jinns, not to angels. He thought, this is what I force on them. Things believe in me as God because they have no other option. So he made a decision to give somebody an option whether he believes in me or not. And for that he created a very special instrument. And that's what we call our mind, our thinking process. He gave us thinking, He gave us mind and apparatus. And then He gave us the choice. Do you believe in Me or do you not believe in Me? You see, that's a classic uh, maneuver which God made with human beings. And in lieu of that choice, He made us more superior than anybody else in God's earth, you see. So He gave us the superiority over all the rest of the things. And then He gave us a credit. Even if you made a little effort and you reached the recognition, you will be awarded, you see. Somewhere in the skies or somewhere in the universe you will be awarded. I reign over my very special utopia that's called heaven, you see. There are other contenders also. Angels thought they deserve that utopia. And James thought they deserved that utopia. But ultimately the man was chosen for that utopia, which is called Jannatis. Jannat is not imaginary. As we know, immensity of the universe around us, billions and trillions of stars, it's not, not a simple idea. If you, you look at the mountains when the green streak comes, and we know it is uh, emerald, in this mountain. You can always suppose after 15 more billion years perhaps this whole mountain will turn into emerald. Similarly there could be stages, places in the universe in which the whole mountains could be of emeralds. The ground could be very different. It's all combination. We are being given days. He could create much finer places up there. So that thing is imaginary. What people thought that there may be it must be an idea, Jannat may be an idea, Dozakh may be an idea. Yeah, heaven or hell is not an idea. They are not imaginary creations. God doesn't tell a lie when He tells you you have to go there, you have to go there. These are the chosen pathways. And when you end up your life, you go those paths. If you have discovered the truth in reality, you have a, another way. It's like you see, the pub and people come from outside, they put them in quarantine us because they are afraid they may not have brought something, big disease around in this earth. They are poor, they are examined, and there they are brought out. Similarly, you see, we are, we are put in the graves. It's kind of a quarantine. It's a gateway to the higher galaxies beyond us, you see. The squeezed time of 70 years and ultimate goes to the billions, billions and trillions. So the way is very clear. It is well understood means and matters. But the job is also very clear. Over here, all these things you do and you enjoy, and you don't, you don't say we live once. We only die once over here. If we are dead, we are dead. If we have learned our lessons, we are not dead at all. 
So we live for centuries, not for centuries, for trillion years of years. Unimaginable vastness of life is ahead. So nobody should take this life casually, only for life. They should understand they have a big choice to live eternally or to die eternally, or to burn eternally, or to suffer eternally. Between, uh, you can say, the um, mystics uh, of ecstasy and sobriety? These are two states of mind. But you mean start, some people have very strong nervous system. Some people have less strong nervous system. Some people have very vast knowledge ability. Some people have a lesser grade of that knowledge ability. Some people can, um, I would say, control of your feelings. It's a difference between human chemistry. Maybe they all look for God, but some people cannot, cannot possibly uh, tolerate. Their chemistry gets short of those uh, higher limits of understanding. So those people who are stuck right away and they are not capable of overgrowth, they are called Majju. They are for God. And they are known as saints of ecstasy. They are like Majju. But he's not allowed to talk because he, he will see a lot many things which other people don't see. Their sensory perceptions go to a maximum extent. And uh, they can have a visitations. They can see the film rolling on. Who's coming, who's going, and what is future, what is behind, you see. But they are not allowed to express because Allah, this is not Allah's way. Normal people have normal way of living. This is odd. So saints of ecstasy are excluded from the society. Or the other way, those people who learn, who teach, who, who are capable of conceiving an idea fully, who perceive the truth, and then they are capable of teaching also. They are better people, certainly. They are known as saints of sobriety. Okay. Take uh, the different uh, tarika exercises. I was uh, heard about uh, Zikr, Fikr, Murakba, Mujahida, and the Sufi way. Well, I would say these are patterns. They are, these are patterns and manners which a uh, few people have adopted. They thought they were better. But in fact, you see, all tariqas are one and the same. How can you separate a man of God from another man of God, except for his rank? I'm saying, we start all together. Maybe I'm saying, Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani, Khaja Mayuddin Chastri Ajmeri, Khaja Fuzdin Ganjashakar, all these people start as the same simple human beings with a very, very strong desire for God and for love, you see. Now, we see, there can be no difference between these people. It's not there. No man of God is jealous of another man of God. They are brothers in the same profession, of the same trade. So they love each other. According to the verse of Quran, you see, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ These people love each other for God's sake, you see. So no difference. But the people who came after, they created all these differences. They created all this mannerism in them, you see. You can be balanced and you can move without any concentration towards God, you see. It depends on your mind, the way you choose, what kind of a method are. Suppose I feel hungry. And my way of, of removing hunger would be that I would eat less. I would eat less, according to the Prophet. I would say, okay, I will not eat full. Maybe I distribute my food to somebody else, to a brother of mine, and I, I ask, okay, my brother should eat with me, and that I should not eat a full stomach, I should remain on this side. The other person say, well, no, I should starve, so that I would get over of this hunger. Now starvation is a harder way, one day, two days, three days, and he will persist. They were some very strong-willed people. They, were no, they knew they had certain force which could not go without hard exercises. But people like me, very weak, I mean, say, we were very small people and we thought we should only love God more 
When I think my body, body makes a fault, I say, I should love God more. I try to compensate things with love of God rather than, you see, star in my own self. Because uh, uh, as according to Mahatma Sudhartha Buddha, even after 12 years of tapasya, he said it doesn't lie in killing your body. It doesn't lie in starvation. It doesn't lie in you hanging yourself on the uh, 20,000 heights of Himalaya. It lies in understanding. So we use our mind rather than you see starving yourself. People have their own means and methods, but not all of them turn Sufis out of those means and methods. And as Quran said, these people have taken to the harder way of understanding reality and truth. And some of them got through. Most of them fell apart. So? So, uh, <coughs> uh, this is a question uh, is more related to uh, to Pakistan. Uh, uh, do you think there is a kind of uh, golden age of Sufism who ended? Uh, ended? I think it's the beginning of the golden age of uh, Pakistan. Of Sufism, Sufism. Yeah, yeah, Sufism in Pakistan. Sufism, Pakistan are one and the same. Frankly, telling you, this country is not a politically made country. This country was basically made with one slogan. And the slogan, which I already told you, which is the greatest priority of the saints, that the whole earth is made for God. Pakistan ka matlab ka. What is the meaning of Pakistan? They used to raise slogan, La ilaha illallah. There is one God and no God. So the whole country is basically made out of a mystic law, of a Sufi law, that this country belongs to God and is made by the people of God. And then we fell apart, we deceived ourselves, we deceived our ideals, and then we suffered until now we are suffering. But now there is a movement of revival. All movements should be in time. All revolutions come when God wishes them to come, not me, not you. So the time has come and Allah means so. People are reviving their old faith, they are coming back to God, they are coming back to that Unitarian concepts. They know they have made a mistake and there is a mistake they have made, they are very bad rulers on them, you see. So they are starving, they are short of electricity, they are short of everything. Whereas this country is richer than uh, hundreds in practical. So we know now we have to get back to God, we have to beg Him so that our children don't starve as we are starving, you see. So back to Sufis. It's not Sufism. Back to the real Islam. Back to the real believers. Sufi is just a word. But the real word for this is a moment. To gain that Iman, to gain that Islam and Iman. You see, Islam is a general condition of faith. Iman is a very particular condition of faith. Iman is equivalent to Sufism. You see. Sufi is a rather a word given to a mu'min, a man who has high faith in God. So in Pakistan we are turning back. Kullu yarjiun ila asl. Everything goes back to its origin. So we are also going back to our Prophet and God. Inshallah. You are looking for harmony outside. Harmony is a basic law. When you go to search and look for something, if you are divided within heart and mind, if you are divided, you get divided in actions also. So this is the basic thing a Sufi gains in this search, that is heart and mind, they coordinate, they correlate, they reunite in their wishful thinking. It's not that only mind thinks of God. Basically the basic emotion gets out of the heart. It burns for God. It wishes for the truth. That's how 
the mind also in the beginning does not agree, but finally it also moves along. So this is absolutely a very fair, a very fair balance of mind and heart that leads you to God. It's not half mind or half heart. It's a full heart and a full mind. And now again, you know, the basic approach is not illiterate. Illiterate has no way towards this. But illiteracy are of two kinds. That's academic illiteracy. Maybe he's not PhD, not postgraduate, nothing at all. But still is very much literate about his inner self, you see. The knowledge of self, all this knowledge which is on earth in degrees, in classifies, engineering, medicine, this is vocational knowledge. You mean to earn out of these all professions and all knowledge is for professions. Even an artist makes a picture for, for earning money, you see, for recognition of money. So we say there's only one pure knowledge, the knowledge which is looking for the ultimate truth, which is not rewarded by any elderly king or queen. It's only rewarded by God, I may say. Rest of all branches of knowledge lead to vocational and professional achievements, and this bit of understanding only leads to the ultimate heights of truth. And this is basically mental, no illiteracy. Even God, I mean, see, curses rather, you see, and blames those people and feels, uh, you see, very strongly angry about those people. Inna sharad dawa be indillah sumun bukun lazina la yakinun. The worst people are my, you see, amongst humans are those who do not think and uh, do not consider our ayat as worth, uh, worth the mind. They do not think at all. They just blindly faith in, have faith in God. He doesn't like blind faith, you see. He again he says, Layahalaka, manhalaka, ambayonatan. Anybody who succeeds, who dies, dies because of a bad argument. He dies because of a wrong argument. And though and anybody who lives, lives with a good argument. So Allah is all for knowledge, for argument, for um, constantly thinking. And uh, he created us for thinking, not, not for just, you see, like animals. That's the difference between us and the animals. Animals have a blind faith. We do not have. Uh, what is um, the relationship and the, um, you can say, the, the, wor the, um, the work, yes, the work, um, between the, uh, you can um, define the nafs, the qalb and the ruh, well, so you see, many things have been said about all this. Actually, you know, when you don't know a thing, you always pass a confusing statement about those things. You see. When people didn't know much about nafs, they, they, they said it is the greatest enigma in the history of mankind, what is nafs, you see. But it's not, it wasn't difficult. Nafs is actually the basic packet of your instincts. You when they get together, they create a self, and that's that's nafs. And kalba, I think, is a is a place, is a very equi-balanced place where wisdom and nafs both act. It's a place. If I don't have a place for anger in my heart, I won't get angry. Even the certain works very hard with me. So we we provide him something from inside. So there. It's a kind of a land in which he costs his um, seat. So if we, the heart is a place which lives with God, with the more, it only remains happy with God. But when it is not with God, it's a land of all, you see, uh, mischief. So everybody can come and put some wrong in it. So as I told you, when the things go correct, cull nafs. From a bad way of thinking, he moves on into vanafsim vasvama sabaha fa alamaha fa juraha wa takwaha. God has created everything in balance. Even nafs has a 50% of wisdom and 50% of the satanic impressions, you see. So when they get balanced, heart gets balanced, even rue gets balanced. But when it gets corrupted, heart gets corrupted. Even the spirit gets corrupted and you go to hell.
But simply, when these are, you see, impaired, when they are not fun properly functioning, they are not fulfilling the purpose of their creation, they go to hell. And if they succeed in knowing themselves, even a particle of faith will not die at all, you see. They, even a particle of faith can take you to heaven, if you are sincere. So basically there is no big difference. We use, people use, mystics use this word for facility. They don't have any, uh, you see, worthwhile explanation what is heart and what is this. Maybe a teacher explains it metaphysically, the other mystically, the third one, you see, scientifically. And uh, basically they, they use these words and phraseology for explaining certain conditions of mind. So nafs is a word which is used for all negative qualities of man. And kalb is, is, a, is a, see, a name which is used for a, a balanced sheet which has 50 percent both. And ru is used for the utmost purification of life. These are th three mental conditions. Well, I've never found a difference between ru and nafs and all this. Because to me they all work together. Okay. This way or that way. Yes. This is a continuum, in fact? Kind yeah. of con this is a kind of continuum between them? Yeah, I would say sometimes there is a contradiction. Your mind wants something different, and your heart wants something different. This, this happens with everybody, you see. But those contradictions are ultimately solved when they converge on a decision. They have to reach a decision. If they are not coming to compromise, that man will be considered to be very indecisive. So naturally they have to come to a decision. The moment they come to a decision, the heart and mind. Suppose the heart wants uh, uh, to eat and the mind forces him not to eat. But normally, normally I must tell you one thing, heart rules. Normally. Wishes rule. Normally desires rule emotions rule and the center of all these blind forces is not mind. Mind is a computer. In a half a second you give a feeling to the mind and it intelligently interprets it, gives it clothing, gives it words, makes a sentence, expresses a desire. But the, basically the emotion is born in heart. Okay, okay.